But the thing is, the American dream, right? Owning a home, and part of it is you're generating wealth by owning the home. And if you look at the numbers today, that can be true or it cannot be true, but more and more of us are renting. We're renting for longer. Right now, it's 40% of Americans are renting their home. Hi, I'm Marcella Sapone. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Alfred, and you are watching Behind the Brand with Brian Elliott. Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of the show. Marcella, welcome. Happy to be here. Well, I should say welcome back, but it's been <laughs> too long. Way too long. Dog years. Yeah, but um, you've been killing it. I usually ask my guests, how did you get this job? <laughs> I made it for myself, <laughs> which is, I think, what more and more of us are doing these days. But we uh, started this business in our dorm room in business school, and it's been a wild ride since then. Mm -hmm. I give us some more context. So. Um, I guess recently I've been asking this with the context of kind of knowing that there's a lot of young people coming right out of school pretty soon, uh, whether it's high school or college, trying to figure out what they want to be when they grow up. Let's go back in the, the chronology a little bit to young Marcella. What did you want to be when you grew up? What were you thinking about? When I was really young, I used to read National Geographic, and I thought I wanted to be an explorer, take pictures for Nat Geo. Okay. My cousin did that, and instead um, I, I kind of went on this business track. Um, and really was trying to figure out uh, how businesses worked and also just more mission driven. I think when I started in undergrad, I was looking at all of these kind of commercial big companies and thinking to myself, wouldn't this be a great way to change the world if a business could be powerful and kind of setting precedent? So. Mm -hmm. I want to unpack a little bit more your quick pivot from Nat Geo photographer into like full on legit business boss. Um, oh, did you get some pressure or pushback from people or did you decide that on your own that like, this was my path? Well, I think the thing that attracted to me about Nat Geo was storytelling and going to extremes and frontiers and kind of seeing things in a different way. Mm -hmm. And I think I'm a natural storyteller, but once you start telling stories, sometimes you find one that enchants you so much that you kind of fall in love with this alternate universe. And um, you can start to almost play with imagination and turn your imagination into reality. And the best possible way to do that, I think, is to start to create a business. And, and so you gotta learn how business works and finance works and people works and marketing works to make all of that happen. But it's this really fun, incredible experience to like start with a blank piece of paper and just imagine something. Um, and if you can really visualize it happening, uh, it, can, it can happen, it can be real. Mm -hmm. What did your parents do? My father was a chemist and we moved around a lot as a kid because his job would take him to different countries. And my mother was a teacher. And so I grew up in Denmark um, and on the sea uh, in this cute little townhouse and I would ride my bike to school every day. And Scandinavians really get it. Like they're pretty woke in terms of a culture. Everything is very efficient. They were on the sustainable climate bit long before most of us ever got there. Yeah. And after Denmark, I moved to France where I finished high school. And then I got this kind of bug, which was to kind of discover different cultures and how people lived. And that became the thing that kind of pulled me around the world. So I studied urban planning. I lived in Argentina, I lived in China, I lived in India, I moved to different cities in the US. I've lived in like 50 different places in a short period of time. And so what I'm like most fascinated about is how people live and, and there's so much power in starting to compare different geographies and say, what's the best part of living in Denmark? What's the best part of living in France? And how can you start to combine those and design the life of your dreams? Yeah, I mean, it sounds like you became that explorer after all. I guess I did. I didn't put that together, but I think you're right. It's a good question. Yeah, and, and you know, again, to frame that with context, I think um, so many people, and, and this is maybe age agnostic, they are so concerned about uh, the result. Right. And the destination, and to have it all figured out. Right. And I don't know how you feel about it, but I feel like that doesn't matter as much as just starting to move your bones yeah. in the direction that you feel compelled. Um, and I guess now that I'm a little bit older, I have a little more life experience, I'm feeling like um, 
there's a combination, a kind of a sweet spot at the intersection of what you're really great at and what you think you love to do. Yeah. And then you just have to go try it on for size, <laughs> you know? Yep. And uh, it's not always going to work. It doesn't that, always fit. And that's the part that's hard. It's the recovery. I think it can be exhilarating when things really click. Mm -hmm. But we're always in a constant cycle of, you know, anytime you're growing and evolving, you go through the cycle of like really growing into something. And then you kind of get stuck a little bit. And you have to like disrupt yourself again and again and again to get mm -hmm. this like evolution. Yeah. So yeah. I think you're right, though. I've been writing a book in my head. And the title of it is How is the Destination? Mm. And some of the chapters around it are like embracing like the feeling of being in the future, but being present at the same time, which are very, it's like the paradox that you have to, you have to work on it. Yeah, I like that idea. And um, just to carry a little bit further, I feel like um, even though it's hard when you realize, you know, you, you look at something on the mannequin, you're like, I would look great in that. Totally. You try it on, it's like, oh, not so much. <laughs> you know, either it's too tight somewhere, or it doesn't look as good as you thought. Um, I think at this point, even though it's disheartening yeah. and disappointing, yes, and sometimes it even feels like a waste of time, it's actually necessary because very few people get it right the first time. There's people who, you know, who started a website in like 2004 and it turned into like a multi, multi, multi billion dollar enterprise. But it probably took 10 years. Right. Um, but the trajectory, yeah. you know, from where it started, you know, it just kept going this way. Right. Others, like my path, you know, I can, you know, I can think, um, I worked at a pizza place when I was a teenager, when I was 15. Uh, and then I worked in a ski shop, you know, tuning up skis and, and snowboards. And then, but as I look back on that, and I'm just thinking kind of about your international experience. Yeah. It seems like, and you can tell me how you feel, like nothing goes to waste. Nothing goes to waste. All of that, I'm sure you're using now in your sort of, you know, anthropology, sort of your cultural anthropologist, you know, uh, exploration here of this new business. Completely. And if you really zoom out, even like these periods of time when if you're a driven person, you look back and say, oh, I was wasting my time. That didn't get the outcome I wanted. Or I wish I had already been successful. We're always kind of comparing ourselves to this best version of ourselves in our head. Yeah. And beating ourselves up about that. Yeah. But if you really zoom out and you look at the whole thing, each one of these moments adds into like this greater depth of experience, which will yield a much bigger outcome than we have the ability to see right now. Yes. So it's this perspective that you have to trust this process and kind of be a student of your own life and an apprentice. Like your, your job is to go collect lots of different experiences and it's all going to make sense probably at the end, even if you're trying to put together a story that makes sense for right now. Yeah. And it's hard to remember that. Yeah. And I, I actually think it can fall on either side of the fence. So it's sort of like this adversity idea yeah. that it can either kick your ass um, and you give up. Yes. Or it punches you in the mouth and you go, damn it, I'm getting, you know, back up. Yeah. Floyd Mayweather style. And so it's like these little, what seem like off ramps, you know, on your journey, uh, turns out it's just part of it. When you can reflect on that, at least I've been thinking about this a lot because I, th you know, I think back to those days at the pizza place, lamppost pizza, yeah. um, slinging pizzas in the back and then washing the dishes and then interacting with the customers, that kind of customer service I'm using right now as I'm, you know, talking with clients, negotiating with friends, talking with, you know, people who are a big deal, like all of that experience is now benefiting me, but it's only because I want it to. Right. If you just toss it away and you go, that was not, you know, that was a waste or whatever. I don't think that you get the full value of it. Brian, when, when you were flinging the pizzas, what was your attitude towards it? Did you think about it as like you were just getting a paycheck or were you curious and like interested and kind of having fun? I was super excited and I was really good at, at, at twirling the pizzas. And I was like, and I, and I recognized too that I had ambition. I've had ambition all my life. Even at the pizza place, I rose through the ranks quickly. I was washing dishes, of course, like everybody else. We all had our turn. But like I kind of developed this reputation as someone who could make great pizzas fast. Um, and so they slowly moved me from the back of the restaurant to the front of the restaurant. 
Um, you were all in. It was like that was your job and yes. you were going to do it the best possible way and get the most out of it. Yes. And it's like that living so wholly in the moment, mm -hmm. but also having confidence that this is somehow going to fit into your future. Yeah. That's like for me the real flow state. And it gets harder and harder as we get older because I think we're aware of the time diminishing mm -hmm. versus like that first job. You have like all of the way your whole world is waiting is waiting for you. Yes. Yes. Right. Um, I agree with that. And um, yeah, it's this idea that I didn't have very far to fall. Right. I, right. I, nothing to lose. Nothing to lose. You know, uh, and now you're right. It is even though. Technically, it's easier. Like if I wanted to start a new venture today, I know what to do, what not to do way better than I did when I was in college. Right. But it's like I have more to risk at the same time. You're also not as um, joyfully naive, right? Yes. About the process. Yes. And people sometimes ask me if, if you could go back and do this all again, would you? And the answer is, hell no. <laughs> I would do it differently. But um, the process is what, again, yeah. makes the outcome. Yeah. And sometimes I think that everything is just training for the next big thing. Yeah. And if you can keep that positive frame and keep zooming out and also just like kind of enjoy when stuff isn't going perfectly well. Right. Um, then it can be more fun. Yeah. It's this idea of sometimes you win and sometimes you learn. <laughs> Right. Perfect. When you, you know, you get the sand kicked in your face, you know, I, I say to myself, oh, I'm learning today. <laughs> that didn't go well. Okay. I'm learning. What am I learning? <laughs> not to trust that person again or not to do that mistake again, but. Yeah. Well, learn fast. Yeah. And what I remember from the last time I talked to you, so Harvard grad. Yeah. McKenzie. Then stuff starts to get crazy at McKenzie. Yeah. And you have this you know, vision of a need in the market. Uh, talk about how Alfred has evolved since then. So we started a company called Alfred after Batman's Butler because we had this idea that to kind of rock our careers and be an interesting person and eventually one day have a family, and have friends, you needed to get help and you needed a sidekick. And we started to fantasize like this idea of an avatar that you could just constantly be like, Alfred, can you help me with this? Yeah. And then wondered, wait a second, that's definitely going to happen. So why don't we get on with it and start to build that into our lives a little bit? So or the original idea for Alfred was a sidekick that, you know, would make your home just work like a machine. You'd return, there'd be groceries in your uh, refrigerator waiting for you. Dry cleaning would be there, your packages on the counter. You could like coordinate anything you needed. You could have a chef come over and cook dinner for you and your friends. You could have a party on the spot, right? All on demand. All on demand. And we had a really fun ride of that. I, th I think the thing that kind of really shook the market was the idea of earning the trust of the consumer enough to be a part of every aspect of their life and earn the right to walk past the front door and just help them with everything and get their time back. And also just um, democratize the idea of help and do it in a way that it was a lot of respect, right? This is my friend. This is my uh, like sidekick in helping me live my best possible life. And there's a shared mutual respect. Yeah. I mean, uh, when you rise the ranks in corporate America, wherever you are, the world, Amer you know, not just America, but you've got a PA, yeah. right? And it's sort of like your little sidekick PA, whatever, um, who basically is the glue that keeps your life together. Yeah. Now um, all of us deserve that. And it can be a really rewarding relationship. So that was like the beginning of Alfred. And it's today, mm -hmm. today, I, I, it's so much bigger. So what I would say is Alfred's probably the biggest landlord that doesn't own a building. <laughs> and what I mean by that is we're this living platform. We manage over 300,000 homes. And most of these are in big cities, so 52 cities across the US and Canada. And we manage the experience of living in a community and really focus on how do we make this community be a vibrant, healthy place to live. And that includes everything from the amenities, the actual property management, all of the software to make it a super slick Uber like experience. And also this is really like the most important part. Our rent 
is the biggest check we write every single month. It's like the biggest purchasing power we have. Yeah. And yet the relationship we often have with our landlord is kind of tense and... Terrible, really yeah, terrible. pretty bad. Most of the time. Basically the word landlord is a, is a dirty word. And it goes the opposite way. People who rent are like second class citizens, right? Absolutely, right? Yeah. And you're just a rent check. You're just a rent check, yeah. first of all. And second of all, like when are you gonna buy a, a home? Yeah. And I genuinely believe, and the data is there, that it's, it's, the world's changing. People really ex want to experience more of the world, like me when I was yeah. younger. We want mobility and flexibility. And it actually can make more sense for everybody if we are living in a more compact, urban, kind of sustainable, closed loop way, instead of owning a home, buying all the things that go into ho the home, maintaining the home, it, home ownership is completely overrated. Yeah, you know, I just think that options are great. Options are great. I would love to have options. But the thing is, the American dream, right? Owning a home, and part of it is you're generating wealth by owning the home. And if you look at the numbers today, that can be true or cannot be true, but more and more of us are renting. We're renting for longer. Right now, it's 40% of Americans are renting their home. And we have this crazy idea at Alfred, and we call it A-Life, which is every dollar of rent that you pay the landlord, you should be getting rewarded for. And the longer you stay at the property, the cheaper your rent should be. Hmm. And the loyalty idea, program. Loyalty program that's giving you more and not treating you like a second class citizen. Yeah. Because again, it's such it's a big part of your income. Yeah. And and it should feel like you are building something. Yeah, yeah. I, and I'm renting right now. And uh, it's because I want the ability to be mobile. Um, I want options. But also, like you're saying, you know, I, I do feel like I'm somewhat under the thumb of the landlord. And, and yet, it turns out my money is good everywhere. <laughs> right? Like, Completely. everyone will take my money. That's right. Wherever I rent. Right. So, like, I don't need to put up with that if there's a better place to go. So, I love this idea. Well, the thing is, right now, there are is a housing shortage and finding great places to rent is harder and harder. Mm -hmm. So landlords are, you know, having a fun time increasing the rent, mm -hmm. but really don't have this attitude towards residents that is this is the biggest consumer product on the planet. Yeah, it's super transactional and yeah, I mean I think my landlord's bloodthirsty, you know, uh warmonger, like just the most terrible person, you know. Uh <laughs> But you're right, so, so say more. So, I mean, this dynamic has existed for a very, very long time where the renter feels like they're not getting a lot of value. They, you feel like you're throwing your money down the toilet, yeah. right? And there's a sense that if I had in, this is a mortgage, at least I own the home at the end of it. Right. But what if we could say, you're gonna get max convenience, max flexibility, you're gonna have a perfectly designed home. We're gonna really pay attention to how you use your space and what's important to you, and we're gonna be here to design your lifestyle, give you back your time, mm -hmm. and optimize for what you wanna be spending your time on. And all of those conveniences are going to net into actual like savings and a sense of place and flow and belonging that is what more and more of us want coming out of COVID. And so what we're saying to the landlord is, we're taking over your building, we're putting technology in, we're gonna make it feel like it's 2022, but we're also gonna treat the consumer completely differently, which is, they aren't a rent check, this is a community. And if you make people happy, this will feel different, the building, you will walk into the building and the experience will be different. It's like an intangible component and it makes their investment be better. Well, yeah, and I guess in theory, there's a whole retention argument there, right? right. And we've proven it. So, you know, we've been doing this now for seven years and it's just a stone hard fact that an Alfred Power building is a more valuable asset. We help landlords refinance. We help, we help landlords lease up buildings faster. And we have some of the longest tenured residents in the business. And that, you know what's crazy? An average rental building churns 50% of the building leaves every single year. Mm -hmm. That's the standard. Mm -hmm. And if you did an NPS survey, it would end up at a negative 11, which is worse than the DMV. Yeah. And these are really nice buildings that we're talking about, yeah. um, but there's so much room for improvement and it's super simple. It's just think about the people here and set up their life to empower them to live their best life. So what's the model? Like uh, if, so I'm the consumer, I'm looking at a place, how do I know, how can I find yeah. an Alfred managed? 
So you're going to look for an A on the door. Uh, there's a checkbox on Street Easy to look for Alfred Power Buildings. You can go to uh, helloalfred.com to see all of the buildings that we manage. And the model is pretty simple. It's we guarantee that the rent that we have on our site is the cheapest of anywhere on the internet. Then those buildings that we are managing have our Alfred technology, which is a super app. It's like a remote control to manage everything in your life down to signing your lease with your finger, moving in and having all the options of movers that are approved and we've negotiated the best rates. If you want to set up renter's insurance, set up your Wi-Fi, rent furniture, we've found the best possible rates and we give the consumer options. We're just here as your advocate. Mm -hmm. And then you move in, you set up your life. Maybe you have a dog, you need to set up a dog walker, a dog grooming, groceries in your fridge, essentials that come without you having to think about it. And really start gearing you towards, okay, how do you want to spend your time? What are your, what's your goal for this year and how can we help you? And all of the staff on site will know your name. They know your pet's name. They know what your goal is. They're inviting you to events. We have some of the coolest, coolest events and programming out there, like whether it's like learning to cave dive or like henna tattoos or learning actual like interesting skills that are unique, doing a tour of a vertical farm. We're not talking about wine and cheese. We're doing things that and giving you access to experiences that you can't get anywhere else. And what we find is that yields real community and a sense of place and place making mm -hmm. and the most fun part about what we do is when people move from thinking about renting as a transitory thing to being really proud of being a resident in an Alfred building. Yeah, this sounds amazing. Yeah. Uh, I'll push back just a little bit because it's almost like too good to be true. Oh, it is. Um, so you said, if I heard you right, that you guarantee that the building is the best rate. Yes. So you look at the market rate in whatever city, if we're in LA or New York or wherever we are, and it's going to be competitive. Right. Um, and then how, how are you making this scale? Because, I mean, it's, it's the old Alfred model sort of, you know, laid out over this right. bigger vision right. to sort of make communities um, or, you know, basically it, it's a B2B and a B2C yeah. approach at the same time. Right. You're appealing to both. You're saying, let us sit in the middle and put hands together and make the experience be better for everyone. Let's make it better for everyone. Yeah. So we start with a service. We earn the trust of a consumer. It's really about making their life easier, giving them back time and headspace. Then we went to the landlord and started to look at how they were managing and realized they're not using any software. Everything is manual. Oh yeah. yeah. It's just stuff that's been built in the 80s that's being used for accounting. 1% of the budget is going towards technology. So what pushback? Because I can imagine they're like, hey, Marcelo, well, we don't want to change. We're fine. We're fine. We got a management company. <laughs> and I come know. in and I say, okay, this is what we're going to do. I'm going to make this cheaper. We're going to use less of this staffing. And the staff we are going to have is going to be trained differently. They're going to be hospitable. They're going to be proud to work here and we're going to pay them more. So if, if essentially you're getting, you're, you know, sidestepping the management, traditional management company and replacing them. That's right. And you're going direct to, you know, B2B and saying to the property owner, the building owner, we want to be the new management company. Yeah. And, and we we'll bring, and we bring management companies with us that are trained with our playbook and use our technology and um, have a different retention. So we basically are finding the best management companies in the, in the market, some of which we own and some of which are just our partners. Mm -hmm. And we go in an owner and we say, look, we're your single stop. If you want to maximize asset value and make this be the best possible investment, hire us. Mm -hmm. We put our software in. We create a network of homes that make it really easy for an Alfred resident to move from LA for six months to New York for six months. And this loyalty program that retains residents and you already start to see a difference. So how are you doing it? Because it doesn't seem like, I mean, I, I can't do the math in my head, but like how is what you're doing, because you're offering so much more, yeah. cheaper or competitive enough for them to say, oh yeah, you're right. Let's, you know, out with that management company who's antiquated, still using 80s software, just, you know, hard paper yeah. products that are signed and returned. I mean, really it's more efficient staffing, right? Is a huge part of it. And then also just using data. So like we know 
if residents are happy or not, what kind of residents live in the building. So when an apartment becomes available, we list it and we market to the type of consumer that we know is successful in the building. We also can anticipate if someone's going to stay or go, so we're putting listings up sooner, which means there's less downtime and less loss. And then the renewal rates, because of all the community programming and just the ability to live life a little bit more conveniently all through your phone, changes the duration that people are staying in these properties. And every percentage point has a huge impact on the bottom line in these buildings. Mm -hmm. It's just that they've been doing things a certain way and nothing's really evolved in a meaningful way since the invention of the elevator, right? right. Like that was like the last big invention yeah. in like the rental, like multifamily yeah. housing market. That had to have been more than a hundred years ago. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um, can you weigh in on, I remember this sort of news headline about what Zillow did, I think it was about a year ago, um, where Zillow was buying up lots of right. residential real estate. Right. And then like, buying you know, whole blocks or more than just blocks, several blocks of right. houses. So they could, well, it looked, it looked from the outside that they could have more control over the pricing. Do you right. remember this headline? I do, yeah. yeah. Perfect, a perfect market where they can control the price and had all the supply and demand on their platform. Yeah. Turns out like market making when you're trying to be the whole market is really hard. Mm -hmm. And it's uh, maybe easier when you're focused on a local market that you have a lot of knowledge about. But it was a big bust. It, it um, almost turned the company upside down. Yeah, I remember uh, speaking to a couple of real estate friends. Uh, they were all up in arms, like, you know, we can't believe they're doing this. So I don't know if they quickly backpedaled, yeah. changed their, their story. Well, how do you think brokers felt about this? Yeah, I mean, uh, I guess I don't know. So real estate was totally crazy, right? So in every other market, what does technology do? It comes in and it gets rid of a middleman and it gives you transparent information. Mm -hmm. Real estate has been one of the most like resistant to it. However, even though we have great pricing information, you go to Zillow, you can see what the property traded for. A lot of it's on the public record, but they make it really easy for you. Even though we have all that information, the broker still plays a pretty important role today. Right. And why is that? Well, they carry the paper, right? They carry, they do all the, well, you tell me. <laughs> part of it, I mean, yeah, part of it is like the titles and the registration and like kind of the legal stuff. But another part of it is just, it's about making a perfect match. And having all the information out there is different than someone who understands what you're looking for, what you are prioritizing and has been in the physical space and is able to kind of match make. It's a really big market. It's a really big decision. And for a really big decision like this, like we're what, one third to sometimes half of our income is going there, we kind of want our hands held a little bit. And if the, re if the resident isn't paying for it, even better, right? Which is in rental kind of how it works. Right. A little bit different if you're selling your home. Right, right, right. What else have you learned about real estate? Because you sort of become, I mean, you change industries, but sort of, uh, it's, it's complicated. I don't know how to articulate it. Um, I feel like you've always been in the technology business, but also the efficiency, like you've always been there to save people time right. and make their lives better. Yeah. It's like an iPhone model. It's not a phone. That's right. It makes your life more convenient, easier, efficient. How would you describe it? I would say, go, let's go back to that zoom out. And we're building this unavoidable living platform that's here to try to set you up to live your best life and be a sidekick for you. And in doing so, we've had to kind of look at how things are done today, how real estate works today, how services work today, how people want to live, and kind of like shake the model a little bit. Mm -hmm. And it's a really big, wild vision where the idea that, okay, we're going to change everything when it comes to rental and home ownership, that's crazy. And like, yeah. What about, is this a concierge business? I don't get it, right? Uh, here's the deal. Like, as a consumer, the biggest check I write every month is my rent. We think that you should be getting the most out of that and that ultimately what you're paying for with that rent check is for your lifestyle and for home as a service. And we're saying this is life 3.0 where tell me what a perfect experience of living at home would look like? Is it, are you spending a lot of time at home or are you kind of crashing there? Are you yeah. using it to 
have guests over? Is it the place where you work out? Is it the place you work? What did your family look like? And let's design like this kind of perfect life to kind of maximize your time on the planet and get the most out of what you want to do with your time. Yeah. And also in the process, start to meet people that are kind of like you and look kind of similar and on that similar like life stage. So like we do everything from like student housing to single family rental. And it's really fun to watch people kind of graduate through our platform and just have this Alfred sidekick be part of how they manage their home and get stuff done. And it just becomes a member of the family. Mm -hmm. So in an entrenched industry like real estate, right. who are the gatekeepers that have been pushing back <laughs> and saying you can't come in or this yeah. is scary or? So real estate is one of the most fragmented businesses out there. And so it's not one no, it's like many no's. And then you find people who are innovative and who aren't um, just running the same old formula for how to make money. Who's saying no? Is it the brokers? Is it the, the, the Definitely not the brokers. Owners? Sometimes it's the building owners. Sometimes it's the property managers. Well, yeah, property managers I can see because they, they're afraid of losing their job. That's right. I mean, they are getting disrupted. But the fun part is we're just trying to make the jobs that are there better, yeah. higher paid, and more satisfying. Yeah, you're saying evolve or die. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. We all got to do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean... And with the owners, it's not that they're saying no, they just want to see the proof that it's going to make them more money. So right. that's the fun part about real estate. Everyone's pretty clear about what their goal is and it's financial. Yeah, so I can imagine you're getting a lot of, uh, it's not broken so we don't need to fix it. That's right, that's right. But from the consumer's perspective, it's really broken. Yes. Negative 11 MPS, 50% churn every single year, right. a feeling that I'm flushing my money down the toilet, not having a sense of place, not knowing my neighbors, yeah. Walking into a building where someone doesn't know my name doesn't feel good. Yeah, you feel, and yeah, and I'll add to that. You feel trapped sometimes. You yeah. feel taken advantage of. You feel stuck. You don't always feel secure. Like you know, are they going to raise the rents on me? Thirty percent, right. you know, next month because everything's gone up thirty to sixty. Actually, yeah. rents are up in LA. I would say sixty to seventy percent. Are you serious? Yeah, over over market. I think really? at least sixty percent up. Yeah. I had no idea. Now, that's not everywhere. I yeah, mean, that's crazy. you can find a dirt cheap place. It's yeah. just soup, not very safe, probably. Right. Um, but yeah, rents are, it's... All time highs. Well, and like you said, uh, here we are in basically heading into May 2022. Inventory is scarce. And the, the friends I talk about, or talk to in real estate say, there used, there's usually five to 7,000 houses to buy in inventory. Right. right and there's 1,500. Yeah. Um, which makes houses hard to get into because there's less inventory, but it also ra rises the tide with the rents because right. then people are going to get rentals and then the landlords know that they can get more. And so everything's jacked up right now. But, and the thing is people want to be in LA, but if that continues, they're going to find other places to go. And because yeah. of COVID, we have more flexibility with yeah. work. Well, and that trickles down to other desirable markets. So we're in LA, but like not far from us is the heart of Orange County, right. the coastal cities, Newport Beach, Laguna Beach, a little farther down, you've got San Diego and all that, you know, Carlsbad, it's right. really great down there too, but everything's up in general. So it's a, if you're renting, um, you might feel squeezed. Like I, I feel squeezed right now. Like, I don't know how, if we're going to get the- Your uh, landlord increased your rent 60%? They tried to. There's a California law that says they couldn't do that. Right. Um, if they wrote it into the rental contract um, a certain way. There's yeah. a way to be exempt from the law and there's a way that you're not exempt. If they wrote it uh, that you're exempt, then you do have to basically float with the market. If, you, if the law applies to you, then you, there's a rental cap. I think it's 5% plus cost of living, which will probably put you up around 85 to 9% yeah. is the max that they could put it up. Yeah, but still, 9, 10%. Yeah. Like, we're not getting 10% raises anytime soon that I know of. Let's work on it. Um, but, you know, so everyone's getting pinched. Everyone's getting squeezed. Rent is right now is like the equivalent of like grain in the Middle East. It's, it's something has got to give. What's nice about some of our buildings is they're institutional, like long hold customers. It's not um, just like a landlord with a couple of units, which means that they're very like rigid. You can't, we are not increasing rent 60% in Alfred buildings. That's definitely not happening. But there are markets that we've seen 20% rent increases for new, new residents coming in. 
But back to this idea of like loyalty, finding a place that you love, locking in a rate, feeling like you have flexibility and conveniences. Yeah. But there's a lot of innovation that needs to happen here. And it can't just be continuing to squeeze out more rent out of residence. I like the loyalty program idea. I think it's, I think it's really smart because I think maybe off camera we were talking about yeah. uh, the Bonvoy brand and how, you know, whatever, whether it's the, your favorite airline that you fly or your favorite hotel brand, yeah. um, you are incentivized to go book with them because you get rewarded for it. Right. And it's the same sort of idea, right? Right. Yeah. And it's also just changing the mentality a little bit where it's like, you know, the most valuable asset is in fact the resident. And if a resident's gonna stay, stay for longer, and then continue to look in more properties that are like yours in different cities, sometimes owned by you, which is why we work with these big ownership groups that own in all the cities we, we kind of function in, then it is pretty powerful for the owner to start to make that shift because we sp they spend so much time and energy leasing and releasing these buildings every single year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That makes sense. So this show is called Behind the Brand. Um, I talk about brands a lot. How would you describe and how did you come to kind of crystallize the vision for the Alfred brand? What is the Alfred brand? What is the Alfred brand? Well, when I was a kid, my brother had uh, Batman toys and I had Barbie dream house. And I found myself taking Batman and his superheroes and putting them in my dream house. Okay. And there's just something about the Marvel character. There's, we just are so drawn to a superhero version of ourselves. And so the Alfred brand is really meant to be tech forward, connective tissue, the, like the new utility company but has a point of view on trying to be your best friend, sponsor, mentor, assistant, and the sidekick to living your best possible life. And I think that we have kind of hit something in our, our storytelling to our consumers that just to like enchants people and asks them questions about how they're spending their time and shows the trade-offs and proposes, let us take this off your plate and here's some ideas with what you could do with that time. Mm -hmm. And that's fun for people. You gotta make it that easy because we're really busy and we're focused on all the goals in our head. But if you as a brand can align to the superhero version of a person and make it easy for them to kind of reach for what they're imagining is their best life, then you're really just telling the story of uh, imagination that we all have and wanting to be our best selves. Yeah, I mean, it. It is kind of a fantasy to think about um, the rental experience and being better. Uh, but if it's true, yeah. that's pretty good news. Um, I've also like personally watched you and some of your decisions over the years. And I remember, gosh, back when we first talked, um, back in the day when you were first getting started, um, the whole Uber debacle was a big deal with executives making bad decisions. Um, it's under new management, better things are happening, certainly. But I've seen you be very vigilant in your decision making about treating humans well. Yeah. How, how have you done that? I mean, where does that come from? And I guess I ask it because people who watch the show, you know, they're in your shoes in some respect. Like, either they're running brands or they're dreaming about building a brand someday. And I think that you've done it really well. But I think it's remarkable because it's not easy to make hard decisions. How have you done it? I would say that we have defied gravity a little bit mm -hmm. by appealing to people's best nature. And I'm sometimes asked if I'm a commercial person, which I take to mean, are you kind of maximizing like this experience for yourself? Like, have you made as much money as you hope to? And is Alfred really what you expect it to be? The thing that's really important is kind of just being clarion and clear about what the values are and trying to create a little ecosystem, a little microcosm where if we just tweak the values ever so slightly and then lived it and you give people that experience, you can then inspire kind of a cascading effect. So it's not just about Alfred employees or Alfred residents. It's about all the other brands, all the other founders who heard me talking seven years ago about something about how we're treating workers doesn't make sense 
and won't make sense over the long term. This yeah. is set up to like automate people away, but technology should really put people at the center of things. And we have the ability to make really profound relationships instead of transactions. And these relationships are the basis of an enduring brand. And sometimes I think we get so focused on like transactions and outcomes and numbers and you got to play the long game. And I'm just kind of betting on, I think that we're slowly going to evolve into like a pretty important generation defining platform. And it's by just sticking with your principles, even if you're not maximizing your profits, mm -hmm. which, you know, since there are hard days where I'm like, hmm, maybe I should be doing that. <laughs> but I couldn't really wake up in the morning and do it. And I, I think it comes from growing up and living in different cultures and feeling hosted by different people, like where I was a stranger and learning and people were opening up their lives for me. And I think that sense of travel can bring out the best in people in wanting to share their own culture, their, their own stories, their own family, their own experiences. Yeah. And there's nothing transactional or commercial about that desire for humans to want to understand each other and share their stories. All right, so, so what comes next? So we've talked a lot about learning and how each of the things we do is just preparation for like the next big thing. And there isn't anything more important right now than figuring out how we keep this planet and retain life on yeah. this planet. Kind of important. Kind of a big deal. Kind of why with so many people, all eyes are on Elon Musk right now. Yeah. Because of electricity and solar panels and uh, Bitcoin and Twitter. I re you reminded me, you tweeted this the other day. I was fascinated and I wanted to dig deeper. I'm glad you brought it up. Okay. Um, so I think Elon is having a moment where he's kind of pulling his suit off and saying, hey, I'm like a superhero here to save the planet and kind of just inspiring us into being like, guys, we have to focus on this. So one of the biggest emitters is construction and how we consume electricity in our homes. Mm -hmm. And I think that if we can start to tie in like back to like paying my rent, how am I getting my carbon footprint to zero? And we've been working in the background to get buildings to net zero, which is really, really hard, but in fact doable. And that's a huge deal. A huge deal. His point is how we're going to live on this planet is changing. And part of the focus we need to take right now is what are the small ways with every transaction, every dollar, every moment that I'm spending, how am I getting alignment with that global unified purpose to do better? Yeah, I mean, in the same sentence, I feel like it's an indictment, like I'm I'm at fault. I'm also complicit. I, you know, I am living in a capitalist society, um, consuming, <laughs> which I'm okay with. I mean, there's almost, I would say there's no way around it. There's no way around it. We've built this, but, but now we can build into the system. Right. But I, I guess what, what, the point I was going to make, so whether I'm buying tennis shoes that were made in a sweatshop, probably were, um, that's hard to avoid or, um, if I am uh, talking on a device that was you know, made in a foreign country that we are not friendly with at the moment, whatever the case, there, there is no way around that kind of stuff um, if you need to function. But what I hear you saying is that in little small ways, we can take the steps. If we don't have $44 billion to invest in this, that, or the other, but we can make small steps towards progress. It's happening already. If we sat down five years ago, I would have been talking to myself about this. And now it's, in every checkout on an online store, it's giving you the option to be green. Every cool business that's launching right now is giving its profits or making sure that it's net zero in some way. Consumers control the world and how we move our dollars. That's, right. We have swords and we just need to pick them up and start fighting. Right. And it hasn't been easy. The system hasn't allowed us to make a change. What's scary, and kind of interesting is like, that's gonna change because it needs to change or there will be no more capitalist system market to play. Well, it's back to, we've come full circle on evolve or die. Evolve or die. And it might be literal this time. It's like, we need to do something about it. It's uh, too bad that we uh, got ourselves here, 
but what will be fun is that we're going to have to unify and work together to get ourselves out of it. And it's possible. So small, small decisions and also just like avoid the freaking plastic. Do you know like every piece of plastic was made to live a hundred years? Just like my whole, I'm, I'm playing right now in my old, my own home, like how not to use any plastic and it's totally impossible. Yeah. It's yeah. totally impossible. No, I've been realizing that too. It's, prob it's probably killing me too. Like uh, the, the bowls or the, the th you know, the beverage that my almond milk comes in is yeah. probably plastic and so it's probably contaminated or, you know, I'm probably just slowly killing myself. We've been changed forever, but right. uh, there's also advancements there to make sure that you live on in like Borg format, <laughs> as long as we don't fry the planet. Right. Let's start with jokes, make small decisions every day. Yeah. When we all start making them, it's like, you know, like each of us is a little ant, but an ant can move an entire mountain. Mm -hmm. And if we need to, they can move really, really fast. I mean, we were just sitting back, you know, <laughs> chopping it up, reminiscing about the good old days and all that. <laughs> you know, tracking my roots, where I came from and where I'm going. But like I say, man, always said it. It's not about the destination. It's all about the journey.